Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on Miraculous, Tales of Ladybug and Chat Noir. Season 2, Episodes 23 through 25. Let's be honest, this is mostly going to be about the finale. They ended this season really good. But let's talk about the one episode we watched before the season finale. With Maledictator, which adds more credence, in my opinion, to Lux's theory that Style Queen was supposed to be the season opener. Because all of that would have had a lot more impact if it was spaced out. Style Queen at the beginning, Queen Bee right after, and later with Maledictator. Because now it was so close together that... Okay, it's two seconds later and we're going to trust Chloe again. Yeah, just the way they ordered the episode, it's so weird. And it's hard to blame Disney on this one, even though I think they're the worldwide distributor. Because the first season, they didn't affect the French episodes as much. They did a lot of switching around for the American airing, but they didn't do much in the French. But this time, the French and Americans... Uh, episodes matched really closely except for a couple of weird flips of episodes i'm like why did they put that episode there in the american order and it's really interesting because shout factory is the one who does the dvd and blu-ray releases just really interesting that's a good episode i was like wondering when they were going to get around to commoditizing the mayor i mean it had to happen eventually because you know, it took a while before we saw any re at all. I mean, eventually you're going to run out of victims. Mm-hmm. Though, this just popped into my head. Realistically, there was uh, one re at the beginning of the series. Well, it was realistically at the end of season one where they put the intro episodes. The origin story, yes. Yeah, and the origin story, if you really think about it, the Stone Guy was actually akumatized twice. But that was because Ladybug didn't catch and purify the Akuma. Yes, but I'm just saying technically that would be considered a second Akumatization. But it was still off the same butterfly. But these ones are true seconds, especially in the finale. It like, actually happens like four or five times to a couple of people. And I have a feeling we're going to see that lady again who does Volpina. Because she almost did that willingly. There, there was no fighting it. It was, I'm here, I'm ready. He released her and she said she was ready to come back because he says your part's done for now. She's like, I'm on standby. Because she really wants to be important. So yeah, I'll get into those details when we actually hop, hop, hop over to them. But Maledictator, oh boy, that's, a, that's another one of those dangerous powers. <laughs> Yes, I speak and it shall be so, but apparently only if my power globe hits you. Also, Ket Noir. That was great. I've been waiting the entire series for someone to do that. Oh my god, he is like the cutest cat ever. Also, how Ladybug used him at the end of the episode. That was perfect. Because everyone knows that Chet Noir is the cutest cat ever. Just check the... The fan art. Just make sure to have the safety filters on if you don't want to see some of the more interesting stuff the internet can create. Safe search is your friend. I also like how Chloe goes, ooh, that's a nice weapon. Ladybug looks at the gun and goes, no. Pulls off just the laser sight. Like, wow, oh, you think I'd use something like this? Toss. Though that also makes me go, why didn't you just make a laser pen? I, I mean, why did you generate an entire gun if you were just going to use the laser sight? Other than a visual gag for the episode, but... Apparently the Lucky Charm has a sense of humor. Apparently. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. And also Master Fu said, at least in the English version in this episode, that the Lucky Charm is never wrong. Just some interesting stuff. And I got a whole bunch of new theories. <laughs> Many thanks to those last two episodes. Oh boy. I find it very interesting that Maledictator's two fingers on his glove were a different color and that's what he had to touch and speak to it was almost like the kiss kiss motion hmm but i think it was like the same on both his hands those are also the two fingers he used a lot on both of his hands and though i think at the end he may have used his entire hand to create that really giant ball yeah the evil villain version of a spirit bomb 
or a booyah bomb, depending on which franchise you follow. Oh, yes. Splatoon. That is a wonderful game. Ah, wish I could play it more. <laughs> yeah, in this particular um, episode, some of the facial animations felt kind of off to me. But there were other times where I was like, that's good. That's really good. Like, the really good one was particularly when Ladybug was talking to Chloe. The expression she was giving while Chloe was, like, saying stuff that was annoying Marinette. <laughs> it was a very subtle stuff, like, mm, hold back, hold back, you need her help. <laughs> <laughs> You're picking her for a reason. Also, nudge, nudge. Chloe, what really happened? Okay, closer to the truth, Chloe, what really happened? Though that particular scene... The way you were saying it reminded me of a scene that happens between Cat Noir and Chloe in the next two episodes. <laughs> Say the magic word. Transforme moi. <laughs> no. Oh, that magic word. Oh. Oh. Didn't quite catch that. <laughs> I love the fact that even though it's Adrian, he's still playing Cat Noir. Yeah. Doesn't matter at all that it's Chloe, his only childhood friend. Still treats her as Chat Noir would treat her. Which makes perfect sense, because you have to keep a, if you have to keep up a secret identity, you have to keep it up with everyone. You have to stay in character all the time. Apparently even when you're D transformed, split between two walls. But any other um, last ideas for episode twenty four? <laughs> Oh, you're just dying to get ahead, aren't you? Uh, no, it's just ideas keep popping into my head every time we mention things. It's how my brain works. Well, how about that this matches the timing for when Marionette gives a miraculous on loan to someone? Because it was the twins who were akumatized when she went for Alia. It was Alia's sister who was other sister who was akumatized and Alia was trapped when she went for Nino and now it's Chloe's father who's akumatized when she voluntarily includes Chloe. Mm. Though we know from the way the Style Queen episode played out she was originally going to give it to Alia which is interesting and kind of shoots up that theory a little bit because Style Queen was Chloe's mother, but it's all about who do you trust. Also, I love that Chloe as Queen Bee almost ran into a wall. <laughs> also, I love how she's still fanboying the heck out of it. Or fangirling. Whatever, she was really fanning it up. <laughs> like, oh my god, I've always wanted to do this! Oh, oh. Also, I love how Chloe is the classic hothead superhero. Not even thinking, just... Right in it. No time for strategy. No, okay, what's the plan? Okay, we're hiding and observing. Nope. Straight out. Daddy, you need to stop this. Also, I love the fact that she's also kind of like the Tony Stark of the group. Everybody knows. Mm-hmm. Though from what I understand, that actually wasn't the original ending of the Iron Man movie. Because in the comics, he actually has a secret identity. In the movie, it was supposed to be that way as well. But the actor ad-libbed that part and everyone was in, we lack that <laughs> we're gonna go with that because everyone went that's tony stark he's tony stark because <laughs> tony stark would be like yeah i'm i'm rich i don't care but yeah she is like everyone knows she doesn't care <laughs> which was also kind of an interesting now that i think about it twist on the whole secret superhero identity secret identity thing for the reasons of protecting the family because since papalia knew who her parents were, he was able to use that against her. So that also shows that little thing that the usual reason that superheroes have a secret identity to keep their family or friends safe. So that's an interesting little thing. Doesn't apply quite so much in episode 24 as opposed to the finale. Because he didn't know until Queen Bee showed up in 24 that he was going to be dealing with Queen Bee when he created Maledictator. In the finale, Papillion was positive that Ladybug would go call on her allies, which would include Queen Bee, because she's made more than one appearance, and Carapace, and Raina Rouge. Also, I love Alia at the party going, 
I know Rouge and Carapace have saved Paris, too. We didn't throw them a party. And Marinette going, oh, we don't know their secret identities, <laughs> duh. Yeah, I also like how Chloe is still being Chloe, but she's definitely showing and keeping her character development. Because there was a little bit of loss of that in season one, because there were a couple times where she showed some character growth, but then in the following episodes, tsh, nothing. It didn't stick. Now it's in small doses, but it's starting to stick. Okay, this finale is very well paced. I mean, through the two parts, it is constantly going uphill, building that tension until the very end. And just everything about it, I was like, okay, we're going to get the superhero team together. How is this going to fail? Because it's not going to be this easy. The team has to fail. Also, smart of Papaleon and how he used all his akumatized people. I also like the fact that if you were confident and didn't have fear, the butterflies were like, eh. Just showing that it is possible to resist if you don't give in to negative emotions. And we really got to see that this time. This shows that Papalian has been planning stuff, and he's we really started to see him planning stuff. Like, in a couple episodes, he referred to, like, ah, I've been working on this person for a while. Like, that idea was actually introduced in what I would consider the season opener. And in this one, he was working on the lady who's Volpina and keeping an eye on her. So he's been working on Lilia all this time. And he knew exactly what to say in that interview to really tick her off. Is he was just like, yes, I made this Ladybug movie. It's important, true heroes, unlike that fake Volpina. I didn't quite catch everything because the subtitles were going kind of quick for me. But was she saying that she was afraid to go back to school because of the akumatizations and that Ladybug and Cat Noir were doing terribly? Mostly. She was lying to her parents. She told her parents the school was closed because of all the acclimatizations. Ah. So that's why she wasn't at school, is because she told her parents the school was closed. So she's lying to her parents that the school is closed. She's calling in and lying to the class about which country she's in. She's keeping her parents from talking to the principal claiming he's been akumatized too, grabbed the cell phone, hung it up, so the principal hasn't been able to get a hold of her parents to ask about all her absences. And I didn't catch which country did she say she was in? Kaur. K-O-W-A-R, according to the subtitles. Hmm. Yeah, I caught the gist of that scene, but I wasn't catching all the little details, like specifically the lies she was telling. Because I believe she also said she was still dating Adrian. Yes, um, when her mother came in as she was hanging up the phone on her fake video chat with the class, asking who was calling, she said it was Adrian because he's so in love with her that he calls all the time. You know, I have a feeling that the mother sees right through this and just trying to give her space. Like, when she wants to tell me, she will come to me kind of thing. That or her mom's one of the... Dense moms, which is possible. Entirely possible, and I don't know, probable, because it sounds like Lilia's done this for a long time. Yeah, she is. I wonder if she's a, uh, give me a skin here. I can't think of the exact term, but I want to say chronic liar. They can't help but lie. Uh, it starts with a impulsive? No. You mean compulsive? Compulsive liar, yes. That's the word I was looking for. She can't help but lie. She actually has a condition that makes it so she can't tell the truth. It's not just her wanting to be popular. It's a, probably a combination of that and that stacking on top of it, creating a whole big mess of a person. But this episode was well executed. I was really excited watching it. I'm like, ooh, this is getting good. And if I didn't already know there was a season three... They they could have had me believing that they might have won at the end of this episode. Mm. And I only knew there was a season three because, you know, it's listed there. <laughs> yeah, we're just a little behind. So, especially, there, there's a lot of stuff going on, uh, specifically the last episode of this two-parter. All the layering and all the things that happened to really beat down the heroes... <laughs> 
turn all of them against her. All of the allies that she had personally picked out succumbed to being akumatized. Also, that was really harsh with Alia and, you know, oh, that was harsh. Oh, I don't know what she was saying because I couldn't quite catch what was in the subtitles, but I knew she was, like, angry at him. Well, she got hit by the arrow, so she was succumbed to the dark emotions and was saying horrible things about how worthless he was. Okay, I didn't quite catch what she was saying. I knew it was evil. I knew it was directed at him, but I didn't know what the words were. And he was pretty much ignoring it because he knew it was from the arrow. But when she succumbed, then he gave in to despair and succumbed as well. That, that whole scene was kind of harsh. I'm like, oof. Oof. Yeah. Alia got her suspicions confirmed and, you know, it was like, huh? Yeah, uh, that, that poor boy. No, he did. I was like, he, he, he liked her before, but now he's probably like, damn, girl. Because those outfits are skin tight. Well, remember, no capes. Though <laughs> uh... no, I do have to admit, I like Queen Bee's transformation sequence more than uh, Reyna's. Queen Bee seems a little more elegant, and Reyna seems a lot more like she has to brush everything into place. And she has to do the mask, the ears, and then she has to reach behind her to fluff out the tail. Also, we've definitely seen a lot more of Papelion's transformation in this season. You know, this is a season where there's no longer any doubt it's Adrian's father. Just in case you weren't paying attention. By the way, it's Adrian's <laughs> father! He's evil! He's evil! I know. He's evil. I know. He's evil. I know, book! He just hurt puppies. I know book. <laughs> I've read books like that. <laughs> it's kind of like some of the stories I've seen where literally a character just goes, there's a plot point over there, Captain. Hmm, we should avoid that plot point. We can't help it, Captain. There's a plot over there. Gosh, darn it. <laughs> also, I didn't quite catch Papillion's name when he's like double transformed. Yeah, it's not that impressive. Purple-edged Papillion. I'm like, there's a lot of red in here to be calling it purple. Also, there was like another willing person in this episode who got akumatized. The assistant. Yes, Natalie. There's another episode that really hammers home that she's like, anything for you. Especially at the end when we find out, ooh, so that's how the peacock works. Or this is how it works when you use it unsupervised. Yeah, I wonder if it's like, that one's meant to work in tandem with another one. Or if there are special preparations you need to take. Or if they're just plain using the power of it wrong. And just everything about that end sequence. The tension was like so built up at that point. We're like, how is this going to and how is that? Okay. So what did Papillion say when he was hit by the feather? Basically, no. <laughs> Okay, because I had a feeling it was just no, but I, I didn't know if it was like the specific way of saying no, like it was being important other than the word no. No, it was basically a no, don't do this, which once we saw the how badly off Natalie was, we can see that it wasn't just, oh, he's being taken over and doesn't like having his own style of power used on him. No, there's consequences beyond what we see in the moment also what's with the giant bug because it was a moth probably the type of moth that he is but oh uh, she says allow your despair to transform into a guardian so the power that came to papillion created that creature to defend him yeah though um, this definitely also points to the fact that adrian's mother was Definitely the peacock lady. Just in case we had any doubt left. Also, I, uh, I have a bit of a theory here that I don't think she's actually dead. The mother. Though, if that's true, there is going to be some complications with, depending on how things work out then, between Papillion and his wife and Natalie. Yeah. Though, I, I, I kind of started to like the idea that you said, like, 
he she's probably going to divorce him because of everything he did. If she's the kind of woman we think she is. Because Adrian doesn't really remember her and Agreste idolizes her. So we don't have a good perspective on how good of a person she was. You know, is she going to be grateful that he went to all that effort? Or is it going to be the traditional hero's reply of, how could you bring such destruction on my behalf? Don't you know me better than that? Also bringing up some other interesting observations I finally clicked into my head. I don't know why it took this long, but when Papillion akumatizes someone, they can use like their special power as much as they want, especially if they were previously a miraculous. They can use their special power multiple times. Unlike when they're just regular miraculous, they basically use their power, their special power once, and then they have to recharge. So that's kind of an interesting thing and how it could be like layered. And there was a lot of layering going on in this episode. Because Papillion gave power to Catalyst, who turned around and gave power to Papillion. So he basically used his own powers to multiply his own powers. And then used all the Kumatized people's powers in kind of like stacking fashions, like how the Cupid-like character gave negative emotions to people and then he was able to Kumatize those people. Yeah, so anyone who had managed to resist or anyone that Ladybug and Chat Noir got the Akuma away from and Ladybug was able to purify the Akuma... He just re akumatized them because he got them right back into those negative emotions. Though there was this great part where the people who, once they realized Ladybug was back and fighting again on their side, was like very positive emotions. And then they basically like, yeah, we're going to fight on our own. We're going to be the heroes. Because when I first saw that flag come up, I'm like, is this a fake out surrender, Ladybug? And... No, <laughs> it's the everyday people of Paris standing up to help out their heroes. Like, so we'll slow them down. You go get Papillion. So they understood. Larger goal. The larger goal is get Papillion. We'll hold the path for you. Well, that does remind me of the very beginning of the episode where Marionette over promises. Oh, big time. Is, you know, she felt bad because she's a nice girl and does nice things and she didn't plan anything and her parents got macarons for her and then she's called out in class of having macarons when everyone's going bigger and better than previous years because of Ladybug and Chat Noir and she's like great I am Ladybug because even Tiki was like but you save Paris all the time yeah that's Ladybug <laughs> doesn't count oh speaking of tiki again i love how tiki was basically like take all of them <laughs> yeah take all the miraculous we gotta pull out all the stops i'm like tiki girl wow pull it back pull it back we don't have the budget for that many characters <laughs> yes and marinette makes an excellent point of i don't have the time to find and explain to everyone i need people who already know what they're doing is not the time to bring green troops to the battle. Uh, I don't know if I brought this up in the recording yet. I, I love that Adrian still plays the part of Cat Noir when he's dealing with Chloe. Chloe when he's dealing with Chloe. <laughs> that that is that is perfect. I was like, I wonder if he's gonna be nicer. Nope. <laughs> nope. Still totally in character. Good for you, Chat Noir. Mm-hmm. And that also reminds me of the scene in the sewers where they had to recharge, how they kept separate and he was still playing Cat Noir even though he was untransformed. Yeah, he was detransformed and he stayed in character better than Marinette did. Also, I was half expecting um, them to accidentally see each other or something or get a hint of something. Also, they, they are, they have some guts. Wow, just... Jumping off that and transforming. Oof. Yes. Eyes closed because they know the other person's there. So eyes closed, pulling out the transformative food 
so you have in your normal self, regular non superpowered self, falling while you wait for your Kwame to eat the item that will transform them so they can transform you. And all of this has to happen before you hit the water. Yeah, and apparently they re they remanufacture those uh potions so they can rebuild items. Well, I'm sure that each time they use one, Master Fu gets them another dose of the potion. An excellent reuse of the Kumatai's people. Just every opportunity they got, they used the powers very well. Like, oh shoot, Siren again. Oh, bugger transformation. <laughs> Because, oh, okay, we're underwater. Oh, yeah, Siren. Oh, and the animal guy, too. Great. And all of the giant characters teamed up together. Though that is one nitpick of mine. He tells the gorilla, your priority is to protect Adrian. Adrian gets away from him almost instantly. But he doesn't spend any time looking for Adrian. Pavilion doesn't spend any time wondering where Adrian is. So he was told, protect Adrian. Adrian got away. Why wasn't he looking for Adrian? Plot and pacing, I'm guessing? I mean, because the, the pacing was was very tight on these episodes to the point where they even sped up Cat Noir's transformation. Which I didn't quite notice until you were like, they sped this up. I like, pay attention. Yeah, they did! <laughs> <laughs> Though usually they have like different speed versions of the transformations. In most superhero episodes now, they have, like, the long one when we need to fill time, the medium one we use almost all the time, and then the ones when we actually have plot to take care of. And we actually need all our airtime. And then Power Rangers got to the point where we can just run behind objects now and morph. <laughs> Any other points you'd like to bring up? Well, that was kind of my big nitpick for plot purposes, because the entire episode where he is transformed into the gorilla he spends all his time looking for Adrian. And also the Chekhov's gun on Lucky Charm. She doesn't use the object either time. For the tennis racket, she needs the whole superhero team. But they lose three members before she's able to do it. The box, we don't see her Lucky Sight pick up anything. She just says it's a sign that Pathelion will hand over his miraculous. I think in a way it was that, but it was also the fact that the reflective surface of the box gave Papillion away. So I think how the Lucky Charm worked this time is it knew Marinette would hold the box in the right way to protect them from a rear attack. But a mirror could also do that. Yeah, but she wouldn't hold up the mirror to Papaleon. She'd hold up the box, though. So the Lucky Charm probably was like, okay, I need Marina to do this. That will work. Because that's usually how it works. It's like, the miraculous is like, I, I need Marina to do this to solve this problem. Yeah, okay. Then, oh, she's another hint. So I'm going to put out that object, that object, and that. Do you get it now? <laughs> so, so yeah, it has a sense of humor. A little bit. So I want to wrap things up. Is there more you want to go over? Well, let's go back to the beginning illusion of an akumatized ladybug killing Chat Noir on national television. Oh boy, that was dark. But I'm also wondering, would that actually work? Yeah, I don't think the cataclysm can affect Chat Noir. Also, what was really interesting is during the fight with Papillion, he was holding on to his stick with his destruction hand activated he was using his staff in the hand that had the cataclysma so there are certain things that are immune or plot convenience also i was wondering if during that particular sword fight papillion would get any inkling based on chat noir's technique and be wondering once again is this adrian hmm. i don't think he had enough time to think <laughs> no but he'll probably spend plenty of time analyzing the failure of his greatest plan to date. Because, I mean, it was really good. He managed to akumatize most of the city. And he's been 
working on that for a while, so he actually already knew he could do this layering thing. He was just waiting for the perfect moment to do it. Well, he needed something that would make a large portion of the populace upset at the same time, so that there would be multiple victims available. Because otherwise, what's the point? If you can only get three or four, that's a waste of effort. And you have all of these people that you have akumatized before. So, wow, no thought needed. You know exactly what to akumatize them into. You don't have to waste time figuring out what their powers will be. It's already set. Though I must say that was very unimaginative of uh, Vulpina, just black and red. I mean, really, I'm pretty sure Ladybug would transform her into something a little bit more creative than that. Well, it was basically like Chloe's antibug costume when she was akumatized the first time. Also, I liked the reuse of Invisible from that episode of having Samantha track Ladybug to try and track down the Guardian. I wonder what gave her away. I, I know who she actually is, but I wonder what... What thing gave her away that she was following Marionette? Well, I'm wondering if Marionette just assumed that someone would be following her, or if she actually heard something before she got into the sewers. I'm thinking she heard something, because that's when she thought to go into the sewers. Because she was looking around, and the streets were basically deserted, so any noise that Samantha made... Or any movement, even though she's invisible, there's still light refractions. Especially when you go to the whole theory of, like, if you were really invisible, you actually wouldn't be able to see anything. Because no light would get to your eyes. Mm -hmm. Just interesting stuff when you try to, like, think about things. Like, so would the air become solid if I stopped time? Uh, when you watch a lot of science fiction shows, your brain starts thinking of weird questions like that. <laughs> there was a lot of neat stuff, and... The use of Volpina was just the use of all the powers in this episode were really the writers really knew what they were doing. Yeah, because seriously, you have Heartbreaker grab Princess Fragrance to take her up into the cyclone. The cyclone is air and water that could carry the spray of her fragrance. And we had that Egyptian guy, and wow. Just writers had to keep so much in their heads. Yeah, because there were moments of like, oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that now. So it's going to be real interesting how Volpina comes back next season. Because I have a feeling she's definitely going to be back next season, but how? Yeah, she'll definitely be back again. But will she be back entirely on her own? Or will Papillion try her a third time? I think he might, or she'll figure out where he is, kind of, or how to contact him, because she really likes that power. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, it fits with her personality of presenting things exactly the way she wants them to be, whether or not they're true. Another thing that my brain kind of just went over, There's a, there was a lot of brutal stuff in this in these two episodes, like... The death of Cat Noir at the beginning. That whole thing between the turtle and the fox. Oof. Though I do like how upbeat Cat Noir and Ladybug were. Specifically Cat Noir. He helped keep Ladybug. Yeah. I was like, well, just back to the two of us. Us against the world. We got this. I also like how he was always on that rooftop. He was always coming to um, Ladybug. So, so what's the plan? Well, she's the one who has the power that they need in order to win. I still want an explanation of why one Miraculous would be so perfectly suited to undo the misuse of another Miraculous. Maybe it's just a purifying thing overall, so anything that's cursed, not just the Akuma. I still want the explanation. Yeah, I don't know we're going to get it anytime soon. I still want it. Uh, so what else would you like to talk over? Well, it's interesting because we knew Adrian's mother held the Peacock Miraculous. But what we learned this time is that Adrian's father was aware of that fact 
and actually has the miraculous in his possession because otherwise Natalie wouldn't have been able to get to it and Papillion wouldn't have reacted the way he did when it was used on him. And also, wow, he can be very caring because we saw what bad shape he was in when he detransformed after the battle. But our next shot of him is carrying Natalie over to the chair. I now want to know a lot more about this Peacock Miraculous. Because <laughs> it just affects the user so negatively. That you have to wonder why. Is its power so much greater that its price has to be higher? Like how the price of the wishes that can be done with the miraculouses of creation and destruction? Also, the phrasing of the word despair also works with Papalion's negative emotion thing. Are these two miraculouses actually just negative miraculous? But the Kwamis like Noru. You know, they don't like that he's with Papillion. They tried to reach him in that one episode. And in that same episode, they also mentioned that they haven't seen the Peafowl for a long time. So, at the very least, the Kwamis are fond of each other. But these were the two miraculous that were lost by Master Fu. So, are they being used wrong? Because the miraculouses of creation and destruction were given to specific individuals. And the loans that Ladybug does are given out with guidance. And they're coached through using their special abilities. Well, Queen Bee, not so much. I, I think uh, Pollen told her everything. But I vote that they're being misused. Because we already know that Noru's power isn't being used correctly. Because the ability is to designate a champion to strengthen someone. But the perversion of that is taking someone over. Because it would be an entirely different story of, ooh, this car just went over this embankment. I'm going to give you the strength to lift it and bring it back up to the road. You know, that's a positive use. So it's more like how Marionette is giving Miraculous to people. Yes. Like, I'm going to give you the power to help, but when you're done, you must give it back. Hmm. That could also be how they get detransformed in the good version. They willingly give it back. So the purpose has been served, the power is returned. Also, it's kind of interesting how we've never seen Papillion detransform after using his special ability. Well, my question is, have we really seen him use his special ability? Is what he does to the Akumas? I mean, it sounds like it should be his special, but in execution, it's so different from the others. You know, they use their abilities and then they have like five minutes or detransform. Papillion is transformed throughout the entire episode when his chosen fighter is akumatized and is still transformed at the end of the episode when his power over the individual has been broken because he has time for the series equivalent of I'll get you next time, Gadget, if it's the last thing I do. So he's staying transformed longer if that's his special. The power drain on it seems to be lower, which is crazy considering what he can give out. My current theory on that is his power, his special doesn't it doesn't like turn off or anything, or the countdown doesn't start until the akumatized person is deakumatized. That's when the five minute counter starts for him. Yeah, because otherwise the timing doesn't work out at all. And if it's not his special ability, then what the heck would his special ability be? Because there's no reason to hold it back when you have a goal. So it has to be his special. Especially when he's fighting Ladybug and Cat Noir. If he had an actual special that he wasn't using, we would have seen it during the physical encounter with Ladybug and Chat Noir. Also, dang, man, he is, he is good. Just physical fighting those two? Had them on the ground? Well, you know, Agent Treachery will overcome youth and skill. Gonna be interesting in the future season. Very much so.
And, you know, the, now that we've introduced Purple Edge Papillion, are they going to manage to pull that off again? Because if Natalie's willing to be Catalyst, he can kind of do that at any time. The question is how many victims he can get. And how often that layering can be used. And is it like less likely now that Natalie's kind of used the Peacock Miraculous? How long will it take her to recover? Will we actually see her still recovering in the next season? And because she was willing to do that, and because she did that, will Papillion now not be willing to risk her? He won't akumatize her again. Because, wow, he was extremely gentle when he akumatized her. Though it makes me wonder how they're going to one-up themselves in the next season. That's the only problem when you escalate things this much. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like season one of Avatar The Last Airbender. They thought they were getting canceled, so they went for it. And what do you mean we've been green-lighted? At least it's not as bad as what they did to Legend of Korra. Oof. There's only supposed to be one season of that. It did so well, and Nickelodeon went, Hey, can you give us two more seasons? And the writers went, What? So they kind of scrambled to come up with what they wanted to do for the plotting for the next two seasons or so. Yeah. Because it wasn't planned to be that long of an arc. But mm -hmm. yeah, when you see what they've done here, it's like, okay, I can see in the smaller scheme of things, because now we have so many Miraculous in play, because now it's known that Papillion has or knows someone who has the peacock, and the heroes have five Miraculous in play, the villains have two Miraculous in play, and there are still more Miraculous in the box. Mm-hmm. I'm still smiling at the fact that he went all of them. <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> that would have been interesting. Yes, and really, who would you give them to? And you don't have time to find that many people. So unless it's possible to wear mul- I still want an answer to this one. So can you wear multiple Miraculous at once? Because each Miraculous is a different piece of jewelry. And if you're supposed to use the powers of the Miraculouses of Creation and Destruction together to get your wish, don't you have to be a single user to do that? So you got to wear the earrings and the ring. Hope he took the time to get his ears pierced. <laughs> yeah, and how many could you possibly stack? Well, the B is a hair comb. The... Cat is a ring, Ladybug is earrings, Fox is necklace, Butterfly is a pin, Peacock also seems to be a pin, a brooch, and Turtle is a bracelet. Yeah, so far the closest overlap is the pins, and it's possible to wear more than one pin. I, w I was less talking about the physical ability to put all of them on you and the the problem of like, yeah, too much power in one location. Entirely possible, but I'm saying they're all different items. And they were, from what it sounds like, they were all created at about the same time. So why were they all created in different forms? And why didn't you just make it like Captain Planet and the Planeteers? Everybody just gets a ring. So why those forms in the first place? Because one of the reasons to me seems to be to stack them. Kind of interesting. It definitely looks like the writers at least have a clear vision of where they want to take this series. Unlike most um, kid shows that have the uh, Monster of the Week format, they definitely have a plan of where they're taking things. But they're not completely serialized. They still have a lot of, like, um, in-between episodes where it's a Monster of the Week episode. And there's not, like, much progression of the main plot. Yeah, episodes that you could kind of change the order of and nobody would really notice for the most part. And they do something. then they do something like moving those two episodes that are most likely for the beginning of the season into somewhere in the middle at the end. You're like, really? Really? Are we doing the whole Disney thing again where, like, oh... This episode has snow. We have to release it in December. Or, hey, people will forget about this new character we just introduced unless we have another episode right after that one that has the character in it. Because it would have been so much more impactful to have all of those ones that focused on the bourgeoisie family 
spaced out because, oh, Audrey's staying in Paris. He now has to deal with both of them, and Chloe is picking up her mother's mannerisms more and more every day. Mm -hmm. Makes me want to just like download all the episodes and rearrange them on my hard drive and like number them. Like, okay, I think these two are one and two. This definitely comes after them. You just figure out like what the actual order is. That or track down the email address of one of the writers going, so which, what was the order of this actually? Probably a better chance of finding them on Twitter. Well, it, it, this is going to be one of our longer recordings. I don't know what it's going to edit down to, but usually I can shave 10 minutes off the actual recorded time. So, so see you in 50 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> or you're going to have to put a lot more time in on the drawing. Oh, bugger. <laughs> uh, consider it extra editing incentive. Yeah. Well... As you can tell, we're wrapping this episode up. So, we'll see you in the next episode, if you're not exhausted from this one. This has been our thoughts on Miraculous, the tales of Ladybug and Cat Noir, Season 2, Episodes 23 through 25. Okay, we're going to do the short, short version. Do you like these videos? You know what to do. Do you want to go other places? There are links. You know what to do. Thanks and good night. Let me just do the full name. Miraculous, the tales of Ka Ugh, Katie Bug. Why does that keep coming back to haunt me? Uh, I know what I'm doing. I'm mixing Cat Noir and Ladybug together. That's what I'm doing there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive and the form of views, likes, comments, dialogues, suggestions, and, of course, financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.